The topic is Mitigating Key Risks for Transitioning Farmers, the Agri-Risk Project Results. So the Canadian Organic Growers undertook the Agri-Risk Project to examine the risks and costs of transition to organic crop and livestock production. The project team developed a detailed report and a referral tool informed by literature review on farm case studies and focus groups held across Canada. On farm visits, um, they the farm, sorry, the farm visits provided insight into a number of risks that had not necessarily been identified in the lit review as being significant, but were considered major obstacles or risks by the farmers interviewed. Wider input on those risks was then received from a larger sample of Canadian organic growers through a series of eight focus groups held across the country. And we have Carly Livingston from COG who will be doing the presentation for us today. Uh, Carly is the newest addition to the Canadian Organic Growers team, taking on the role of the Stakeholder Relations Manager position. Uh, she began a career in her hometown of Edmonton, where she spent the past few years working in a Stakeholder Relations and Program Coordination across academia, industry, and government for the pipeline industry. However, she is a foodie at heart and self-proclaimed donut connoisseur, I like her, uh, with a passion for all things health, environment, and social justice, which led her to relocate to Ottawa in pursuit of a career in food policy and industry development. On the weekends, you can find her exploring Ottawa on her bicycle, probably lost, seeking out farmers markets, good coffee and fresh air. So she's going to spend about, well, as she's told, she mentioned before the rest of the folks jumped on the call that her presentation is 20 minutes long, and that will leave about 10 minutes for questions and answers. So over to you, Carly. All right, thanks, Marla, um, and thanks, everyone. Uh, so as Marla mentioned, I'm pretty new to COG, which means that I came in right at the tail end of this project. Um, I'm also the government relations person, so if there are any specific questions that I can't answer afterwards, I believe we have Marcus Weber on the line from Saracon, uh, based in Alberta, and he will jump in for support. So I think everyone has the presentation, so I'll kind of follow along that way. Uh, if you go to slide two, many of you are familiar with our project, but some of you might be new. So this is going to be a really quick overview to recap what we studied and how, and then we'll get into the results and findings and some recommendations and next steps. So this project was federally funded by the Department of Agriculture and Agri-Food. The scope was national, so we wanted to collect data from producers all across the country to really understand uh, what were the risks that they faced in transitioning to organic production. What did they struggle with and what tools and resources did they use to overcome those challenges and what could we offer them as an industry to help that next generation of organic producers. So because this was a federally funded project, we had 12 months to complete it, and it started in April 2017, so we had a lot to do with very limited time. Uh, we weren't alone in this project. It was truly collaborative. We had a project management team supported by the Organic Value Chain Roundtable with roughly 20 people on it from across Canada, and those individuals, the few who are on the phone today, were really instrumental in, in getting us to the finished project. We also worked with two firms, Saracon in Alberta and Group Agico in Quebec. So they're experts in the business of agriculture. Many of them have agronomist backgrounds, and they drove all of the data collection on the subject of transition. So what you'll see during this presentation is that many of the findings aren't necessarily unexpected. Um, they're things we've been talking about as an industry for quite a while. It's the prioritization of those issues that might be a surprise uh, to some. But ultimately, the point was for us to be able to collect current, reliable, comprehensive data from across Canada on the topic of organic transition, which is something that as an industry, we, we just haven't been able to do. So for us, getting that baseline was really at the center of this. If you skip to slide three. Um, so this project was designed to figure out what's out there and what's been documented, and that helped inform how we designed the case study interviews. So the goal with the interviews was to get out to farms across Canada, all types and scales of producers, do a few case studies of a few farmers who did successfully transition. Sarah Khan and Group Agico sat down with these farmers and with their books and their records to hear their stories about transition and where possible collect quantitative data looking at things like yields and their fi the finances of that transition. So from there, we held eight producer focus groups and one focus group with certifiers, so nine in total. 
And that was an opportunity for us and Saracon and Group Agico to continue qualifying some of what we were hearing in the case studies so that we had as many opinions as possible and really trying to capture the full Canadian experience. Um, lastly, the reporting stage has been completed. So we synthesized all that information, collected it into a final report, which some of you have hopefully seen. If not, the final deliverables are up on the COG website under past projects now. Uh, in the next few months, we'll be looking for opportunities like today to get these findings out to stakeholders and all of you. And we'll really be promoting the findings of this report because we want to make this as publicly accessible and well-known as possible so that it's used by our industry. So that sets me up to go quickly over each phase of the project. If you flip to slide four, the first phase was the literature review. So we used Farm Management Canada's framework for risk assessment and reviewed on and offline literature. And in doing so, found that there was a big gap in Canada in terms of any research on transition. So now we have this great report that we can use to have conversations as an industry and amongst ourselves and with governments that we can make sure that we're putting the right tools in place to support transition. On to slide five, phase two was the, were the case study interviews. So uh, the on-farm visits took between two to five hours. Saracon and Group Agico administered a common survey across everyone, asking things like, what resources did you draw on to help you through transition? Which risks were most significant to you? What obstacles did you face? So some of it was structured, but most of it was not. It was a lot of talking, getting a history, and focusing uh, on those transition years. We broke that into a number of sectors, so everything from maple production to field crops, um, which does make it difficult to come up with quantitative data because there, there isn't a standard transition crop. But we spent a lot of time with each grower to discover what those pain points were. Um, onto slide six, in terms of participation, we had 40 growers across Canada from BC to Nova Scotia, and we had quite a few in Western Canada. Flipping to slide seven, phase three was focus groups. So in the focus groups, participants were presented with um, an exercise called Snakes and Ladders. So individuals would note what their biggest challenges and risks were. We'd aggregate that and talk about it and come to some consensus on, in their region, what were the biggest obstacles and risks. And that was pretty interesting. They differed considerably between regions. Um, after reaching that consensus, we would move on to the latter portion. So discussing tools that they used um, and what they would have liked to have been there. And there was much more consensus on what they would like to see. And that was extension services, but we can get into that in a few minutes. These focus groups always ended in a brainstorming exercise talking about possible solutions and trying to figure out what might work. So a lot of really, really good work came out of this phase. Slide eight shows the participation of those focus groups. So nine in all um, and 130 participants overall. Slide nine brings us to phase four. So reporting and project outputs. The final report drew on all of this and synthesized everything that we learned. So I'm not going to go through all of these deliverables that are listed here because they are all up on our website now. But you'll find an executive summary the full final report uh, with a description of the proposed transition resource referral tool and um, also an evaluation of three provincial transition programs. So moving on to slide 10 um, and getting into findings, and I'm going to switch the order here a little bit. So understanding certification requirements was a significant barrier for people. Lack of clarity and a desire to have someone in person to assist with navigating the certification process uh, was significant. Often growers were turning to certification bodies and the certification bodies playing the inspection role couldn't provide the advice, advice or didn't have the expertise or the information that the grower needed. Uh, a lack of clarity on inputs allowed for certification was a risk that stems from this as well, and that may lead to a crop not being cert certified. Record keeping was also found to be one of the biggest barriers. Uh, this was a very real obstacle for transitioning farmers, and we heard the same thing from the certifiers group. It was either record keeping directly or some connection between record keeping and the types of inputs chosen. Weed management was another major one, so especially for those transitioning from conventional to organic field crops, it was a significant barrier. And then finding access to technical expertise. In some instances, this was to do with production practices where that change from conventional to organic left people with gaps in knowledge around how to actually transition the farm or plant crop rotations. 
And then lastly, the cost of organic inputs was also a significant barrier. If you go to slide 11, um, just to give you a quick snapshot, when we went to the case study interviews on the farm, um, we administered this survey, Common for All Growers, and what you see is the percentage of growers that responded that, um, that these items were a significant obstacle for them. So on a scale of one to five, it means that they rated it a three or a higher. So the five that I just spoke about were the top five that were found in the survey. Switching to slide 12, we also asked about the risks of transition, and this was our way of tying this back together with the risk assessment framework. So the literature, the literature review found that labor, money management, production, technology, and expansion were key risk categories. And some of that aligns with what growers reported, but it wasn't perfect. Um, again, certification process was identified as a major risk. So either they didn't meet the requirements or they had some difficulty in doing so. There was also economic viability or people losing the market. So there were some growers transitioning to organic for a specific market or a wholesale buyer who then changed their business model when they were no longer or where they were no longer planning to buy what the grower was producing for them. And also, there's also just a relatively small market for organic products, which limits the market opportunities for transitioning producers who may have to invest more time looking at other market channels. In Western Canada in particular, we found personal health or stress, and that's how it was framed in the survey question, but in the final report, you will see it referred to as stigma. Uh, so some of the field crop producers reported distance with their neighbors after deciding to transition to organic production. For some, this wasn't a huge problem, but for a few, this was really significant, and they found their lives significantly different during and after the transition process. And then there were also ones that you would expect, so yield and production and the management of weeds. On to slide 13, we also looked at the financial aspects of transition. So important to note that we went with people's stories and their memories. Um, and a few of the things that we heard are that there were uh, our reduced revenues for some growers, but not as prevalent as expected. We thought we would hear how transitioning markets aren't providing enough revenue. Um, and we did hear that from some crop groups, but it, it wasn't as prevalent as we thought. We heard about high capital costs, especially those that are producing field crops. So a lot of tillage equipment needing to be purchased, and that's a significant barrier in the decision to transition. Uh, demand for crop insurance is something that we heard, um, and, uh, because some provinces have it for organic crops and others don't. Um, and for those that do, there are some issues with how it's administered. And lastly, one thing that growers didn't even really conceive going into the transition process was, again, that some lost their market. And in a lot of cases went from uh, some type of wholesale purchaser to having them have to scramble and market directly to consumers or to some other middleman, which was definitely disastrous for some growers. Um, it obviously didn't happen to everyone, but it, it was a big risk for some. So moving on to slide 14, what was also interesting from the survey results was that although we didn't ask the question, was lack of extension services a risk to you, that was a main finding overall. Uh, there are places where people get great advice, but the primary one that people reported, and keeping in mind that these were people that had successfully transitioned, was that they had some peer or mentor. So whether it was someone going through the same thing as them, someone that had transitioned in the past, they gave a lot of credit to those individuals for their success. But generally, those extension services were difficult for people to locate and access, and overwhelmingly, um, there is a desire for in-person, face-to-face services. And lastly, on to 515, um, although we categorized the risks that we heard, we didn't hear the exact same things across Canada. There were very unique regional issues as well. So things like access to the land and generally high cost of land as a capital cost was unique to BC. But in the prairies, social stigma was something that we didn't see elsewhere um, at all in some cases. Ontario has easy access to market, which in some cases means certification really isn't a high priority. And in Quebec, we heard less problems and more opportunities. And that's one of the recommend recommendations that actually came out of this was that it would be a benefit to learn from the successes um, in other provinces to see what can be replicated um, and what can be adapted. And then in the Maritimes, low organic premiums, if at all, and a lot of the goods being sold at similar prices to conventional. 
So slide 16 is a summary of all of the risks that uh, I've talked about. And it's a really good infographic to just show how they were categorized um, based on data gathered into key, medium, and other risks. This infographic is also up on our website. It's really just an image of what you will find in our executive summary and in the final report. By dividing these risks into key, medium, and others, we it's our hope that we can start to prioritize what we act on and what time frame we do that in as an industry. So on to slide 17 and recommendations. Uh, the key ones were support for extension in two primary areas, production and the certification process. So not only ensuring access to extension, it's actually a need for more resources. So having a resource referral tool, if it accurately lists and compares and updates available provincial resources would be helpful. Uh, fostering the development of organic production experts, but also developing more extension on the certification process itself would be helpful in increasing transition success rates and incentivizing more. Another one was clarity on inputs. So we need a central resource that indicates what exactly is allowed or disallowed to reduce the likelihood of failure when transitioning growers go for certification. Uniformity of process. So standardizing forms for record keeping would be instrumental, not just in making record keeping easier, but also in helping growers with decision making and management in the long run. Learning from success, so there is opportunity to look at what Quebec is doing and support transition um, as they have a larger and faster growth rate than most regions here. We did some evaluation of transition support programs under this project, which again is online, um, but it would serve us well to know what factors led to that success so that we can learn and adapt or replicate. Fostering value out of supply chains, so few buyers poses significant market risks so added, value added opportunities like processing infrastructure might help mitigate this, as well as supply chain development by developing infrastructure to process organic food, for example, feed mills or abattoirs. And then lastly, a transition program. Ultimately, if we want to drastically increase the numbers of organic growers and the size of organic farms, then looking at transition as a holistic program at a national scale might be something that needs to be considered in the future. Okay, so final few minutes here. Uh, what is next for COG? So first and foremost, we will continue to share, um, and we hope that all of you share the results of this project. We hope to see this report broadly used across the industry because this is very much something that we all own, we all worked on it, um, and is a great resource for us. We, and other, other news, we are waiting for a response to a proposal that we submitted to develop a mentorship program to ensure farmers are getting the personal supports that they need. Uh, we're working with the Organic Value Chain Roundtable on a strategy for a national inputs list. Our new practical skills handbook, one level at a time, transitioning to organic vegetable production is now available for pre-order through our website and that should be available this fall. And lastly, and probably most significantly, we're working on the follow-up project to transitioning to organic, so to this project. And we will be submitting an application to the Agorist program by the end of this September. So this proposal seeks to understand what we heard about insurance in this project. Um, we heard some demand for insurance, and we heard from growers uh, that were mitigating their own risks. We know that there are not uh, that there aren't business risk management tools at the federal level specific to organic or transitioning farmers. So we would like to do an assessment of what exists to see really how organic and transitioning farmers fit in or don't to what is currently available in Canada. So we do all of this and we're able to do all of this work because we have incredibly supportive membership. Um, so if you are a member of COG, thank you. And if you're not a member, we hope you become one and join in our work. And lastly, I will just say thank you. Um, thank you to everyone here for taking the time to listen. I know this was a lot of me talking. Uh, before I stop talking, I would like to acknowledge a few more people. So first off, thank you. Uh, thanks go out to Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada for funding this project. Our project management team gave so much to this in the past year. 
to all the farmers that participated and gave us so much of their time. We are incredibly appreciative. And thank you to Karen for inviting me out to present to you all today. Um, if anyone has any questions, let me know. And I'm hoping Marcus is on the line now. So if there's any questions, we will hopefully be able to answer. Thank you.